Welcome to Econa Day Unplugged. Today is Wednesday, November 28th. I am Ann Picker, Econa Day's Chief Economist, and with me today are Jeremy Hawkins in London and Mark Pender in Pennsylvania. Jeremy, lots of stuff going on in Europe. There is a lot of stuff, as you mentioned, but I suppose most of it currently circulates around the good old story of Brexit. And um, I guess now that should at least on paper be approaching some kind of end game now. So on Sunday, then we had the EU leaders signing off on the Brexit withdrawal agreement and the political declaration. Um, And that now means that it needs ratification from both the UK Parliament and the other EU national parliaments. Kicking off will be the UK, and it looks as if the vote over here will take place on December the 11th. Um, now, it should be said that for it to go through, the Prime Minister needs about three, well, needs at least 320 votes, and that would ensure that Brexit goes through as currently written. However, from the way it looks as if the parliamentary parties are stacking up at the moment, she's probably ending up to about 80 or so votes short, and there's an increasingly a general sense that um, it's going to be a no vote within the Commons unless there are some changes made. Now, as I speak, there's some speculation doing the rounds that um, originally the the view from the government was it would be a simple yes or no vote on Brexit as currently put forward. However, it seems now that uh, Mrs May is starting to come down to the view that she can't get it through as it is. Therefore, she may be prepared to allow some kind of vote on additional amendments to the bill. Now, these could range from anything such as a a second referendum or indeed uh, some kind of new version of it. Um, It means that Brexit, of course, itself has just got more complicated. It may mean perhaps you can get this thing through Parliament, but any changes to the Brexit bill as it stands at the moment, of course, won't go down too well with the rest of the EU. Now, in terms of how this pans out, um, if we go with, I suppose, what the odds, the chances are currently suggesting at the moment is going to be a no vote. If we see no, well, clearly it's going to have an immediate impact on UK financial markets and indeed the euro. Don't forget to, I mean, if, if we get a no vote in theory, we're still coming out of the, of the EU come March next year. And also, I think most people regard that as being bad, at least initially anyway, for the UK economy and so for UK financial markets. It also means that the European Union is losing its second biggest member country. So it's not going to be good for the EU either. Um, now, what happens? Well, I'll say clearly, if, if there is a no vote, the, ch- the choices are that the government has 21 days to make a statement to the Commons about what it intends to do next. And then it'll have a further seven days to move any motion in the Commons, allowing MPs to say what they think about the government's new action. Now, really, I mean, the choices, it seems to me, it boils down to potentially a second referendum. It may be they can manage to extend membership of the EU by a period of perhaps a year or so, or that would certainly cost money, which wouldn't go down well with the Brexiteers. Could be a general election. That could certainly be called for if Mrs May loses a vote and two thirds of MPs actually want to go for an election. Or of course, we could simply end up with what I think most people accept as being a worst case scenario, which would be a no deal, which means the UK falls out of the EU on the 29th of March next year. And we revert to uh, WTO, World Trade Organization rules. So however you look at it at the moment, it's still a great deal of uncertainty about what's going to happen with regards to the final shape of Brexit. Um, December 11th is going to be a hugely important day for UK financial markets and the EU as a whole. So really, I suppose, as we stand at the moment, watch this space and just see how the negotiations amongst the various UK parliamentary members go between now and then. Um, Other bits and pieces from Europe, I should mention Italy, which has clearly been one of the factors weighing on the euro in addition to the Brexit stuff for a little while now. As things currently stand, it still looks as if there's a standoff between the Italian government, which wants an expansionary fiscal policy, and the EU Commission, which wants to see Italy holding to its uh, fiscal criteria. Um, Although there has been some mutterings that the Italian government may be prepared to back down somewhat, it still looks likely at this stage that the Commission may decide to introduce the so-called excessive deficit procedure, which would involve fining Italy if it goes to full course. That would be the first time that's ever happened and clearly would raise a completely new question mark of the political stability of the Eurozone as a whole.
Otherwise, you mentioned just in terms of the numbers this week for anyone who's looking at European numbers these days. Uh, we'll have the inflation figures, the flash November inflation data on Friday. They're expected to show headline inflation just slowing a little bit to 2.1% from 22 but more importantly, the core rate staying at 1.1%. Um, I think it's worth bearing in mind that given this collapse we've had in all prices of late, if that's sustained, then people have got used to inflation moving above the ECB's target over the course of this year, but it really could come off quite sharply as far as next year is concerned. Although ostensibly the ECB is looking at the core, well, we know that the core rate's been pretty well flat for a long time now, so we see a flat flat core and a falling headline inflation rate. Clearly, it's going to make the idea of any kind of hike in ECB interest rates even further de- even further distance. Last, just mentioned in terms of the real economy, there's not too much more to say there, bar the fact that fourth quarter eurozone doesn't appear to be show- shaping up too well. The flash composite output index for November, 52.4. That's a 47-month low. Manufacturing's virtually stagnating. And indeed, the manufacturing output index there was down at a 65-month low. So just ahead of what's supposed to be the end of the ECB's quantitative easing program at the end of this year, you know, the economy really isn't behaving as the ECB would want. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, I have, oh, this is Mark. I have a question. Um, you, you, you mentioned that... Uh, uh, the EU would suffer uh, if the UK uh, left, um, uh, missing its uh, second biggest member. But isn't that pretty much already uh, done? Unless I guess there's a second referendum and and Brexit is reversed. Well, it depends, of course, on what on what version the, you know, the departure takes place. If the current Brexit deal goes through, it may not be liked particularly uh, across large swathes of, of, of the, the UK. Um, but I think as far as the European Commission is concerned, they would actually view the departure as being on the best terms possible. So I think on the basis of which, yes, it's certainly true that the UK will no longer be part of the EU, but the trading relationship between the EU and the UK would still be at least potentially Potentially relatively positive for both sides. The problem becomes if the EU, if the UK falls out of the EU without any kind of trading relationship at all, mm-hmm. that's going to hit both sides. But when you say um, uh, the most positive, is it really the least negative? Um, well, at least it's interesting. We had um, a short while ago, the UK government came out with some numbers. Uh, they were forced by the opposition parties to to say what would you know what their various scenarios are. And although, OK, you can say you might want to take these with a bit of a pinch of salt. But these figures suggest that the UK economy could up to could be up to three point nine percent smaller after 15 years under Mrs May's Brexit plan compared with staying in the EU. That said, if we get a no deal Brexit, um, you know, the, these economists reckon that the, the shortfall in UK GDP could be as much as 9.3%. All scenarios, um, as worked on, suggest that the UK would be worse off, you know, moving out of the U- out of the European Union on whatever basis and actually staying in it. And what about so, the EU and the UK's uh, effect in the EU? Are all those outcomes also negative? Well, I think on the whole, it's probably, it's, yes, I think you've got to say it is the case. I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, all the economic reasons, the fact that I think most people would agree that, you know, a slowdown in trade, and if we imagine global trade was just for UK and the EU, any kind of reduction in trade there has got to be bad news for both sides. Um, it's going to hit, you know, the investment numbers from both sides because the growth numbers are going to be lower. Um, in terms of the EU as a, as a you know, political trading block, you know, it's just lost, well, you know, looking into next year, on paper, it's lost its second biggest member, which will re- will reduce its political trout when it's trying to clout when it's trying to trade with the likes of you know the US or Asia. So I think you know net net it's a negative across the board. And is this a long term or a short term? There must be a long term. The proponents must see a long term benefit from Brexit on uh, at least from the UK side, right? Well, I think they do. I mean, the idea is that membership, the EU has, well, affected, it comes down to so much red tape being involved in EU regulations and the fact that the UK can't necessarily implement the legislation that it wants to. That's been a negative on the UK. Um, yeah, the, the contrary argument for that is being part of the EU because of the trade and everything else has been beneficial. Um, but, you know, it com- comes down to which side of the fence you want to be on. I mean, my personal feeling is that being part of the EU, although it has hasn't necessarily been great. It's been the lesser of two evils and has certainly helped UK growth compared to where we've been if we've been outside. 
Thank you, Jeremy. Mark, you've had a busy morning. Yes, we had um, quite a lot of data. Uh, and I guess on net, um, boy, it, the trade data is what stands out. We had initial data on October goods trade, and this is deepening uh, very consistently, and, uh, and it's uh, going to pull down. It pulled down um, third quarter GDP. We have the second estimate this morning by just about two percentage points. Uh, and net exports are starting off um, October, the first uh, uh, month of the fourth quarter, in, uh, in an increasingly negative way at, at uh, a deficit of $77.2 billion in the month alone. And what the, the concern here is not only have uh, uh, imports were basically flat. They've been on the rise lately, and it's raised questions whether or not um, U.S. Co companies were importing ahead of tariff increases, pre-buying, and uh, ahead of expected tariff increases at the beginning of the year. That wasn't the case in October. It was flat, but what was weak in October, unfortunately, was exports. And again, uh, we got hit on the uh, on the agricultural side, and uh, uh, we're in contraction over there, and uh, uh, and we're now moving into year-on-year -year contraction. And this is in contrast to uh, uh, an eight um, percent general rise for exports from this time last year, and, but also exports of capital goods and uh, also consumer goods. Uh, I mean, they were soft. So we have uh, uh, troubles on the on the trade side, and they may very well be the emerging um, uh, effects of uh, the tariff wars. And uh, but it's still a little bit on the on the marginal side. Uh, as far as like hard evidence, smoking guns and things like that. Now, we'll, an offset will be uh, early indications from inventories. We also got this morning retail and wholesale inventories, which are about two thirds of, uh, of inventories, factory inventories have yet to be reported. But um, these were very strong and that's very interesting. Uh, uh, inventories were a big positive in contrast to uh, exports in the third quarter. They, they lifted GDP by about two uh, points and what was a very wanted and needed build at that time, inventory build in the third quarter. It looks like that may be extending in the fourth quarter, which will be a positive, uh, would seem to be a positive for holiday sales, especially in the retail side. Uh, lots of uh, uh, stuff to choose from um, on the shelves. And so that's a good sign for a very important uh, factor, holiday sales. And we also had new home sales. Now, this uh, came in far below expectations. And this is a very volatile report month to month. But if you look at the trends, it's very, very clearly down. It's a slump uh, underway in new home construction over the last year. Uh, we basically have gone from a 700,000 uh, a rate of sales a year to uh, about 544 in the latest data, um, nearly a three-year low. Uh, and what's uh, 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 additional bad news about this is that prices are coming down. And we saw that uh, yeah, earlier this week with Case Schiller and FHFA home price data. We're also seeing it with this data especially. Uh, yet even though uh, prices for a new home, uh, the median is um, $309,700, uh, it uh, is that that decline is only three percent from this time last year versus a twelve percent decline in actual sales. So it looks like uh, sell uh, prices have further down to go. And now what we're getting is a, uh, perhaps evidence of a supply glut. We've been uh, thin in supply uh, all year uh, related to lack of available lots, uh, lack of raw materials, hard to get construction labor. And now with since sales have fallen so much. Um, uh, sales relative to uh, uh, stocks relative to sales are at 7.4 months. And this compares with 6.5 in the prior report and 5.6 last year. So that uh, may be a further negative for prices. However you look at it, housing is not accelerating going into the fourth quarter. Um, it looks like exports it may be the same kind of mix for fourth quarter GDP. Inventories offsetting uh, 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 weakness in exports, which will leave it to the consumer, which will leave it to consumer spending. And probably, even though it doesn't look like it, right now it's going to be an exceptional holiday year, I think it's going to be a healthy, uh, the indications right here are that it's going to be a, a healthy year and it still may bail out uh, fourth quarter GDP. Thank you, Mark. On that note, I think we'll, we'll leave you until next week.